program is brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. We have as our special guest today, Dr. E. W. Mueller of the National Lutheran Council, Professor George Donahue from the University of Minnesota, Vince Rossiter, President of the Bank of Hartington, Hartington, Nebraska, and Arnold Paulson, Chairman of the Committee for Rural Economic Survival from Granite Falls, Minnesota. My name is Arnold Paulson from Granite Falls, Minnesota. This afternoon we are once again going to discuss the rural problem or the farm problem uh, facing rural America. This afternoon we hope to put a little punch into this program and to start our program off I would like to call on Vince Rossiter, banker from Hardington, Nebraska, to uh, emphasize briefly on uh, some of the things that rural America is facing because of this farm pro uh, of this farm problem that exists in rural America today. Mr. Rossetter. Well, Arnold, I don't know that I can uh, see very far ahead any more than anybody else, but I do know that uh, one of the disgraceful things that has occurred in the national economy in the last uh, 13 years is the completely negative participation of the farm economy as we know it. I'm thinking now in terms of the farmer's economy. This negative participation uh, has prevented agriculture from, uh, from earning even one little penny more in the last 13 years than it earned in 1951. While those of us in other segments of the economy and all of us here represented today in our particular fields have participated in an expansion of 1,370 and six tenths billion dollars of more income cumulatively in 1951-64 than we earned in 1951. Now this, in my opinion, is, is a disgraceful thing and still it's being ignored by, by almost everyone. Uh, I think we, because we've discussed it previously, uh, are aware of it, but at the same time it has been overlooked by our government, by our business associations. It's been overlooked by our farm organizations. It's been overlooked by many of the institutions of society who should be calling attention to it. And unless we are willing to recognize uh, this completely negative participation of this very important uh, $230 billion segment of our total economy, uh, I can't help but feel that it'll have very serious implications on the total economy from the cumulative effects and in eventually. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call on Dr. Mueller to express the views of the clergy uh, concerning this uh, farm problem and the effects it's having in rural America and especially the rural church. Well, of course, the, uh, as a clergyman and as, represent, uh, as a clergyman, we are concerned that all people share and uh, participate in the economy and we're on the side of economic justice. And we probably have not been too active in this, but I think the picture is quite confused for us. How do you go about helping the farmer to get an adequate price for his product? And uh, it's at this particular point where we probably have our problems. Some are, now for instance, collective bargaining is being proposed as a, as a solution to this. And I, for one, am not particularly against collective bargaining. I think collective bargaining, we've accepted this uh, structure in meeting the, uh, in helping the urban people to deal with mass production. I would say that if uh, collective bargaining is a tool can be used to uh, give the farmer a better price in rural areas, fine. Uh, from the standpoint of whether it's ethically right or wrong, I don't think this is, to my mind, quite neutral because well, as I read the gospel, it doesn't identify with any particular pattern, see? And collective bargaining is, is one pattern, see? I don't say it's the pattern, it's one pattern, but if it's an effective tool, and if the farmers can demonstrate, or if it can be demonstrated that it can be used, see, there's no reason why it ought not to be used. But I have my problem at the point, can you, uh, can the farmers as such effectively use this tool? Well, I think that's a good point to discuss this afternoon, because on this program for many months, we have been citing the problem in rural America, and I think the time has come and we should look at a solution of solving this farm problem. And with us this afternoon, we have Professor Donahue from the University of Minnesota. And Professor Donahue, I would like to ask you to express your viewpoints about collective bargaining and the uh, possibility of using this tool to solve uh, this farm problem in America today. 
I think that I agree with Dr. Mueller that collective bargaining in and of itself is not illegal or immoral. As a matter of fact, uh, it's neither of those. It's a device that has been used actually by farmers in the past through cooperatives uh, really are collective bargaining organizations. The effective use of them may be held in question, but the fact is that in certain areas, I know the Washington State apple growers, for instance, have used the cooperative method of marketing very successfully for their product, and we could cite others. I do, however, think that when you think of collective bargaining as a device or a tool, you're underestimating what is really involved in the collective bargaining process. It is a process. It's not a device. It's not a tool. It's a concept of how people organize themselves and how they work together. And you don't get collective bargaining by saying, here, here is collective bargaining. You must develop within the people who are going to bargain collectively an attitude, a perspective, a mental set, which leads them to accept the idea of collective bargaining. And here is where I think the rural population is perhaps most lacking. The rural population has been negative towards the concept of collective bargaining, bargaining with the exception of cooperatives. They have, by and large, attitudes that uh, have been referred to before as highly individualistic attitudes, attitudes which actually prevent them from entering in to group activities which lead to the collective bargaining process. Let me uh, indicate this perhaps by an illustration. I think that the average farmer today has a concept of individuality, a concept of independence or freedom, whatever you choose to call it, that is um, perhaps 50, if not 75 years out of date. By being 50 or 75 years out of date, I mean this that he doesn't realize that he's living in an interdependent world. That he still thinks of himself as sort of a semi-hermit who can go about his own business and do what he chooses to do on his own little piece of land. The day that the farmer stopped producing his own good for his own consumption and started to produce his good to place on a market, he immediately became interdependent with his neighbor in the next section of land or his neighbor on the next quarter section of land. When he did this, whether he wanted to or not, he had to conceive of himself in a somewhat different fashion than he had conceived of himself when he was an independent landowner producing primarily for his own use. The fact is, I think very few of the farm population have made this mental transition. I think more of them will have to make it in the future before collective bargaining is a possibility. There are a lot of objections to collective bargaining. Let me ask you, Vince, do you think you can bargain with a perishable product? Well, uh, yes, I do, uh, George. As a matter of fact, there's nothing quite so perishable as labor, and they've been bargaining successfully for this, although some of the product perished in the bargaining process. Uh, I think that this is possible. Uh, it's, it's obviously possible. It's just a question of how much uh, the farm people want to sacrifice to gain their goals of uh, being able to price their own production. And this, again, is a tough transition for a person that's used, been used to husbanding every resource on the farm and uh, the digging out every efficiency that's available to he and his family. But uh, I think it's possible. But as you say, uh, uh, it's going to be a terrific transition for many people. And, but George, I think probably the, one of the faults is they say if you knock an idea out of a man's head, you've got to have another one to replace it with. And I don't believe that we've properly presented this uh, so-called replacement idea while we're trying to knock the idea of rugged individualism uh, out, of the, out of the farm producer's head. Now, what is the potential of this? Well, one of the fears that many farmers have towards our concerning collective bargaining is they automatically associate it with collective farming, such as they have in Russia. And then they follow through a little further, and they say that uh, collective bargaining is, uh, is a trend towards communism. And I'd like to call on Dr. Mueller to comment uh, on this. Well, I uh, would make this comment on this, that I think uh, that, far, uh, that the rural people, in particular farmers, will need to examine their own value system. 
And I think until they do this, they will not be able to feel comfortably with the collective bargaining concept. Because collective bargaining concept, as I understand it, you put a pretty much you give pretty much power to the group to which they belong. And there's uh, uh, an economist in Washington that has influenced me a good deal, who has analyzed the the value system of the farmer over the years and how this has influenced our our various policies. For instance, he has demonstrated or put or pointed up the farmer functions with what he calls the democratic creed, that no one is so wise that he has a right to tell him what to do. Well, there's some truth to this. We don't particularly want anybody else to tell us what to do. Then there's also the, what he called the, the free enterprise creed or the private enterprise creed, that he doesn't want anybody to interfere with his business, not his government, not his neighbor, nor his farm organization. And then added to this is what we call the work ethic or the proficiency creed, where the farmer has status among his peers, if he can produce more bushel per acre than his neighbor can, or if he can put more pounds of beef on a critter in less time than his neighbor with less feed. That is tremendous drive to produce, you see. Now here he has three basic values. See, the democratic creed, no interference to tell him what to do, the free enterprise creed, no regulation on his operation, and the proficiency creed. But the more that he produces, you see, the less he gets, but this will not Permit, but his other two uh, basic values will not permit him to accept any kind of control from the outside. Now, to me, we have to help him to see this and to think this thing through if, if we're going to make any progress at all or are going to even propose or suggest that collective bargaining may be a solution. Because it, while it may be a solution, it, is, it will have, have no value unless you can get a, quite a majority of the farmers to accept it. It will do no good just to have a 25% to accept it. So you've got to go a long ways if you're going to get this thing done, according to well, my idea. I would disagree with you on that, Dr. Mueller. I don't think it takes uh, such a tremendous number of people to, collective, uh, to bargain collectively. This is the idea that if you have a total number of people, you have to have almost all of them to some degree of consensus before you can go ahead with an activity. The fact is that a minority group in society, whether it's a racial or religious group, bargains very effectively, sometimes with 3 or 4 percent of the population or 10 percent of the population. In other words, one of their biggest strengths or largest strengths rest in their organization. <laughs> now, the point you make that the individual is subject to some type of restraining mechanism when he joins a group is true. Is he has to give up certain parts of his individual sovereignty, but in turn, he gets a different type of individuality for it. He gets a certain sense of security out of it. He doesn't lose his personality or his identity, but he has to revise his identity, just as a man in a labor union has to revise his identity as far as his determination of the conditions under which he works. If the group says, in a contractual negotiation with management that we shall work eight hours a day and the conditions of work shall be A, B, and C, if he wants to be a part of that group, then he has to say, all right, I agree to these conditions. If he doesn't agree to them and he decides instead of working eight, he's going to work nine, he'll be subject to the censure of the group. But as long as he can accept these conditions, he's just as free under them as he uh, from a social psychological standpoint as he is under any conditions. And the other myth of the farm area that this brings to mind is the fact that the farmer thinks today he's not subjected to controls. He is subjected to controls. Anybody who lives in a social organization is subjected to controls. His participation in church subjects him to certain controls, of course. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you could enunciate or elaborate on that far uh, uh, more uh, eloquently than I can. But uh, his participation, let's say, in the community uh, uh, as a citizen set certain restrictions. He can't pass stoplights. He can't park wherever he wishes. These are restrictions upon him for the sake of public safety, for the rights of others who would like to be able to go through that stop sign without, uh, go through the other side of the street without getting hit by him as he passes the stop sign. So the idea that he's free of restriction is a myth. He's not free of restriction. What he may be doing is trading certain restrictions for, uh, for others. 
And indeed, his individuality may well change when he becomes part of this group. And if he's afraid of losing this, then he's in difficulty when he goes into collective bargaining. Well, I agree with you that this is a myth that he doesn't have any controls or that he will lose his freedom in case he does uh, join the group. But the fact is it exists as a fact in his mind. And as long as it exists as a fact, the majority or quite a group, a uh, number of the rural people, if for all practical purposes, is as though it were a fact. See? Now the point is, I think, how do we change this? See? I mean, he, he has the, uh, at least as I run into it, and this comes up again and again, then I, and I take the same point of uh, view that you're emphasizing. I use this little illustration to say that here if I go fishing in Minnesota, see, they tell me when I can fish, how many fish I can catch, how long they have to be. See. You'd be lucky to catch fish. Yeah. I shouldn't say that about Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> but now this is not done, however, to, to interfere with my freedom of fishing or to uh, take fishing away, but to give me good fishing. So I would say the same thing is true about these controls. If he imposes them himself, I say if they're imposed upon him from the outside. But coming back, nevertheless, to the point that uh, you say they don't exist, and in fact they don't. But I would say uh, you aren't, people aren't convinced of this. Well, now, I would uh, like to make a point that I thought George would make, and I'm sure he's thinking about it. But uh, if, if we're to believe what we read in the statistics from the Department of Agriculture, 27% of the farmers in the United States control 80% of the production, so the idea that you have to have large numbers of farmers is certainly not uh, the case, because if you, could get, uh, if you could get the production that's involved in a, in a substantial part of the production that's involved in 27% of the farms in the United States, you would be in an excellent bargaining position. And of course, this is, uh, again, going back to the unions, George, uh, the unions didn't bother to organize the little low-paid industries. They went directly into the high-paid industries, and perhaps uh, that collective bargaining will evolve among the larger, the more affluent, uh, the, uh, the farmers with the greater risks, uh, rather than the, the farmers that we're thinking of, our neighbors who are comparatively small. I, I, think, wanna, uh, uh, yes. I think the point is well taken that uh, you don't need a majority. Uh, we have about 70 million, well, 74 million in our labor force now, and I think if you counted every individual who was organized into a labor union of one type or another, you'd probably have not over 20 to 25 million. Let's say it's 25 million. There you have not more than, a, let's say, a third of the workers, and probably those who are in tightly organized unions come closer to 20% of the labor force. Yet, they have a tremendous impact upon what the rest of the labor force gets. In other words, people outside of unions have undoubtedly been influenced uh, in terms of their work conditions by what is acceptable under union contract to union employers, uh, union employees. So I think that uh, the history of labor unions indicates that you can bargain effectively with a minority. But you point out something important, that this minority has to be strategically located and has to have an important part in the economy. Therefore, if you organize, let's say, the lower 30 percent of the farmers in the nation who produce somewhat less uh, than 20 percent, uh, I forget the exact figure, but it's somewhat less than 20 percent of the total product, you might have some difficulty uh, in terms of uh, controlling the pro product, therefore the price of the product. So you must be strategically organized as well as uh, organizing a number of people. Possibly one of the largest myths that we have in America today is the myth of free enterprise. Uh, this seems to be the big fear amongst farmers, uh, the fear of losing their individuality or uh, their freedom uh, to participate in free enterprise. And yet I think, uh, Professor Donahue, you'd agree that we haven't had free enterprise in this country since possibly 1850. Free enterprise is uh, the complete freedom to participate in business without any controls, restrictions, regulations, and tariffs, and so forth. And yet, uh, even the largest industries in America are continually lobbying in Washington for controls and regulations to protect their interests. And I think that the average farmer in America today is not aware or doesn't realize this. And uh, uh, two of the questions I'd like to ask to conclude our program today is one, uh, Dr. Mueller, 
will the farmer actually lose his freedom uh, through collective bargaining? And then for the rest of the panel, do you believe that collective bargaining can work if the American farmers would organize and employ collective bargaining uh, for marketing farm production? You're asking me whether I think that the farmer will use it, lose his freedom through collective bargaining? Right. No, I would say he doesn't lose his freedom. If he himself in his own organization, see, votes this, then I say no. See. But I would, on the other hand, say it is not that simple. I would say that uh, the, many of the farmers think that they will. See. And I think there we have a sort of, sort of a psychological block here that we have to, have to deal with. And, uh, and this, I think, uh, it has to be dialogued and discussed, and I think we have to uh, explain more fully what we mean by collective bargaining. In fact, it's, it's news to me, uh, and it's uh, changed my mind a little bit since you have discussed this, that you don't need as large a group to participate in this as, uh, as I had indicated. But I would say you would need uh, to be able to bring together quite a bit of the production that, and, and be able to withhold a certain amount of production if you were going to make the thing operate. Now, one other point I want to make here, I am a little, uh, not sure on this collective bargaining from this standpoint, how the farmer can, can uh, do this effectively unless he also cuts down his supply. In my mind, he uh, puts himself at a little disadvantage. If he, uh, if he has the, the, the product there, like he has his beef, he has his hogs, he has his uh, uh, a milk there, it has to be sold or destroyed. I think he's in a rather poor bargaining position unless he also begins to talk about uh, thinking in terms of limiting the supply to the uh, projected need. Is this possible or is this, is this off other question? Uh, Mr. Rossiter, I'd like to have you express your views now in the closing moments of this program. You can uh, uh, elaborate on anything that you'd like uh, in relationship to the subject we've been discussing this afternoon. What was that last remark you made, uh, I Dr. Asked Mueller? Oh. Uh, my the last remark was on this uh, that I don't think that uh, in when those that talk about collective bargaining, there's enough said about thinking in terms of uh, cutting back the supply to meet the demand. Supply management. Yeah. Well, yes, you, you've got a good point here. Of course, if we could cut back the supply, we wouldn't need collective bargaining. But it stands to reason that uh, a well-operated collective bargaining group isn't going to uh, produce excess uh, uh, pounds or bushels for the simple reason that one of the phases of collective bargaining is that they have to pick up the excess in order to make the law of supply and demand work. And this excess costs money. In other words, out of their dues that they collect from their membership, uh, part of this would be uh, used to pick up the excess production so it would be lost or wasted, so to speak. So the nearer they could come to meeting the uh, demand of the economy for the production of the food, the less it would cost them in terms of fees and dues to uh, cover this excessive production. So obviously, a uh, well-organized, uh, a well-operated bargaining group will ultimately come to the conclusion that they should uh, limit their production in some manner uh, to the uh, needs of the economy. I think we should say at this time that collective bargaining certainly is not a panacea for the problems of agriculture or the problems of the rural community. I mean, you can have collective bargaining tomorrow and you're not going to resolve the question of the school system and its inadequacy or the religious system and its inadequacy and many other social and economic problems that occur in the rural areas. Unless you happen to be a sheer economic determinist and say we get collective bargaining, we get higher prices, therefore we'll be able to take care of these things. I doubt this very much. I think there are many problems of the rural community that have to be looked to. The other thing about collective bargaining is it's not all positive. I think uh, you have to look at collective bargaining as a device and as a tool and one which is subject to change as society changes. In other words, it's not one concept that's un it's immutable over a period of time, that people would have to look at it. And let's say if people voted for collective bargaining today and tomorrow they voted against it, they could vote against it. It's not an irrevocable act that one takes when one accepts the idea of collective bargaining. I mean, uh, I don't know of any union, for instance, in which you cannot leave the union. You may have a difficult time finding a job in that particular area or in that particular industry later. But the fact is, you can leave it. The other thing is that uh, there is some possibility of restriction of entry into the industry. And we all practice this to some extent, whether we happen to be bankers, ministers, or college professors. There are some controls we exercise over who shall be uh, part of our professional group or our occupational group. 
And I think that uh, all of these facets of collective bargaining have to be examined very carefully by the individuals and be understood. I don't make these remarks as negative to collective bargaining, but I don't want anybody to get the idea that if you get collective bargaining, this resolves the problem. Progress in the technology of farming still has to be made. Progress in the social institutions in the rural areas also have to be made. So collective bargaining is one step that allows organization and power and some possibility to control the elements of your universe. Human control, not control from outside or divine control, but rather human ability to work together and to have some decision-making function over what they're going to do and how they are going to do it. A democratic society is really collective bargaining. We as citizens of this community, of this nation, give certain of our sovereignty as citizens to the national government, to the state, and to the local government, to in turn for which we expect certain services. And certainly in the collective bargaining, whether it's a union or a farm organization or a cooperative, you expect when you give up certain privileges to the organization, certain services and benefits. And if they're not forthcoming, then I assume that people will no longer be party to it. So I don't think of this as an irrevocable act, but an act which could be viewed as one possible system in which the farm group may be able to operate. There are undoubtedly others. We have been led to believe that uh, the business enterprises of uh, this country are operating under the supply and demand theory, which is true. But big business actually controls the supply to meet the demand. And of course, this is one of the objectives of collective bargaining, uh, because they will be able to control the supply to meet the demand uh, for the various uh, farm commodities. And uh, I think we've had a very interesting discussion this afternoon. and. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to have you gentlemen with us, Dr. Mueller, uh, Mr. Vince Rossiter, and Professor Donahue. And uh, in closing, I would like to extend this challenge to every farmer in America, regardless of which farm organization he belongs to or whatever his solution to this farm problem might be. I challenge you to investigate and to study the proposals and the programs that your organization offers you to solve this farm problem in America today. If you are convinced that your organization cannot solve this problem with the present programs that they have, then you had better be sure that you're right. And you better find the farm program that can solve this program facing rural America today. Because the farm you save, the community you save, may be your own. This program has been brought to you by the members of the National Farmers Organization in this listening area in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. For more information or suggestions on how to solve our farm problem, contact this station.